consultant in medical oncology and a senior clinical researcher in experimental cancer therapeutics based uh, at the Churchill Hospital. He came uh, from, from Leeds, having previously trained in Southampton, uh, did a deal with Adrian Harris at the uh, WIM, and then uh, transferred his number by popular demand, I'm told, and then uh, uh, was appointed as a consultant here three years ago. So we're going to hear a bit about the translational research that he's setting up uh, with our breast unit. Some of you will know that breast surgery in Oxford uh, has moved on significantly over the last five years, uh, and it's really good to have the science uh, uh, behind that uh, as a collaboration between uh, oncology and surgery. Simon. Thanks very much. Um, so, as has just been alluded to, my interest is in, in drug development predominantly, uh, and particularly in the breast cancer space. And so uh, today I'm going to present a, a project uh, that we ran a, a, sh a little while ago, which was essentially a, a clinical uh, pharmacodynamics study to try and understand the effects of metformin. Most of you will have heard of that drug, uh, one of the commonest, most commonly prescribed treatments worldwide, and uh, um, uh, treatment for diabetes. We wanted to understand its pharmacodynamic effects on breast cancer metabolism. Um, so initially, I'll give you a bit of background about why we were interested in, in metformin. So uh, uh, metformin's been around for a bit of history. Uh, metformin's been around for a long time. It's actually derived from French lilac, and medieval herbalists in the Middle Ages used, used this to treat diabetes. Uh, hundreds of years ago, but it was uh, uh, first synthesized in the mid 20th century and then licensed for the tr treatment of type 2, type 2 diabetes in the 1950s in the UK, a bit later uh, in the US. Um, and now it is the most widely prescribed oral antihyperglycemic um, uh, drug worldwide. And interestingly, it reduces all cause mortality for patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, so that just doesn't just include. Uh, uh, mortality in the context of diabetic uh, complications. But there's growing interest in metformin's anti-cancer effect. This was sparked by a series of uh, epidemiological studies, um, the first of which was published in the BMJ uh, in 2005, uh, that showed that diabetics on metformin had a reduced uh, cancer incidence than diabetics on other treatments. Um, and there have now been uh, uh, over 50 studies worldwide and a number of meta-analyses. Uh, depending on which one uh, uh, you look at, the, the, the risk reduction is in the order of 30%. Later meta-analyses suggest it may be a bit less than that, but, but, it, but it seems to be quite a strong link. Uh, because of that, there have now been a number of clinical studies which have tried to understand the uh, effects of metformin on cancer cell proliferation. Uh, typically, these have been pre-surgical window studies in which patients have been given a small, uh, a, sh a short course of metformin, two to eight weeks, depending on the study, uh, and they've had biopsies beforehand and then a sample taken at surgery afterwards. Uh, and these have mainly been in breast, prostate, and endometrial cancer. And, and, and in a number of these studies, they've shown that, that metformin can uh, reduce key 67 expression, so a well-validated marker of uh, cell proliferation. Some of these studies suggest that the effect may be greater in the obese population, but that is a little controversial still. But just to show the interest in metformin, the potential of repurposing this drug as a cancer therapy, there's now over 100 clinical trials worldwide. Some of those fall into the sort of prevention space, uh, others uh, looking at using metformin as an adjuvant therapy following surgery to prevent recurrence, and then some are also looking at the potential of using metformin in advanced disease. So despite, but despite all this interest in metformin and hundreds if not thousands of uh, preclinical uh, publications that have, been, that, that have uh, assessed its uh, uh, mechanist, mechanistic effects uh, in cancer, uh, there's still controversy as to the mechanism of action uh, at clinical doses in tumor cells. We know that metformin is an inhibitor of complex one. Uh, so complex one is uh, a core member of the electron transport chain in mitochondria. Um, 
And if you inhibit complex one, one would expect an energy stress. However, those findings have only been, that's only really been observed in, in preclinical studies, typically using doses that are much higher than peak plasma level in patients. But this is, I guess, the canonical hypothesis that, that metformin, uh, um, or the canonical view that metformin inhibits complex one, leading to an energy stress, uh, an increase in the AMP or ADP to ATP ratio. That leads to uh, activation of AMP kinase. Now, AMP kinase is the uh, key regulator of energy homeostasis in cells. Uh, and the downstream effects of activation of AMP kinase are to uh, inhibit a number of anabolic uh, pathways that are absolutely key to cell proliferation. So, for example, fatty acid synthesis or protein synthesis. Um, However, others take the view that it's probably metformin's effects on host metabolism, so patients' metabolism that have the greatest, greatest influence on, on uh, uh, farm chemical effect on, on tumour cells, as it were. Um, we know that well, there's, there's good evidence now, really, that metformin uh, probably does have an anti-mitochondrial effect in, in hepatocytes, leading to AMPK activation. This leads to inhibition of hepatic gluconeogenesis, and this is why you see falling glucose and insulin levels in, in patients. That you would expect to reduce stimulation of the PI3K pathway uh, in tumor cells, which is a, a, a key regulator of cell proliferation uh, and anabolic metabolism in, in, in all cells, uh, and, is al and is already a target for therapy in, in, in cancer treatment. So there's a number of outstanding questions. As, as I've, I've, I've alluded to, there's still this question, of how does it work in, in, in tumor cells? What effect is it having on tumor cells, if any? Of, um, are the preclinical studies relevant, where they've used doses of metformin that are typically 100 to 1,000 peak times peak plasma level, both in, in in vitro and in in vivo models? How should we select patients for future clinical trials, what biomarkers might there be to make sure that our clinical trials are properly designed. How, what's, what, in what space should we be looking at metformin uh, as, as a clinical therapy in the context of cancer? Should this be a preventative treatment, uh, perhaps in diabetic patients or obese patients? Should it be uh, an adjuvant treatment that we give following surgery, <coughs> alongside perhaps chemotherapy and other standard treatments? Or should we be using it in advanced disease? And lastly, how maybe should we be combining metformin with other treatments to, to get synthetic lethality uh, or an additive effect at, any, at least? So this is the, these are the sort of the broad research objectives of the clinical study. So it's firstly to characterize the effects of metformin and breast cancer metabolism, and then also to assess the potential ways that we could select patients for future clinical trials. This is the design. In total, we recruited 41 patients to the study. We recruited patients that had an untreated primary breast cancer. It's essentially pristine, so it hadn't been touched by any therapy before, uh, just after diagnosis. These patients were going to go on to have neoadjuvant pre-surgical chemotherapy. We gave them a two-week window, uh, a therapeutic window of metformin. Uh, and either side of that window, we carried out a series of pharmacodynamic assays. Uh, novel imaging with a dynamic agent FEG PET CT scan, a series of research biopsies for immunohistochemistry, uh, transcriptomics, and metabolomics. And then lastly, we also took research blood samples because we wanted to understand the effects of metformin on host metabolism so that we could then relate that back to the uh, effects on the tumor. Once they completed their two-week course of metformin, they went on to have their chemotherapy, uh, and if they chose, could continue the metformin alongside before having definitive surgery. But essentially, the study was over after that last functional test uh, 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 following the two-week initial, initial two-week run-in with, with metformin alone. So one of the first assays we, we carried out was just to uh, look at the uh, pharmacokinetic uh, um, character pharmacokinetic analysis of metformin in our patients, and we saw that there was a relatively widespread of metformin levels, uh, peak plasma levels, this is about two hours uh, post-dose, uh, 
but this was consistent with, with the literature from our old pharmacokinetic studies uh, um, in, in the diabetic space. Uh, but interestingly, uh, we, because we had tumour samples, we were able to therefore also assess the levels of metformin using mass spec uh, in the tumour samples and then determine whether there was any relationship with our, our serum plasma levels. And there was. There was a significant correlation. Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. But actually, a lot of investigators think that the main uh, determinant of um, uh, the level of metformin in the tumour is uh, expression of certain key transporters to get get metformin into the cell, one, one, the, the main one is, is, is OCT1. Um, but here we see actually that, at least to a certain extent, uh, serum level of metformin seems to be important in terms of the amount you, you get into the, to the tumour. And that's important because therefore dose escalation studies of metformin in the cancer context might be, might be sensible. We, we can, in, in, in cancer patients, I'm afraid, we, we're happy to accept, accept higher levels of toxicity than many other diseases. So, uh, uh, and, and there are uh, um, uh, studies that are going on look, looking at that, uh, particularly in terms of the pharmacodynamic effects of metformin uh, on the cell, on the cancer cells. So moving on to one of the core aspects of the study, and that was to understand uh, whether we saw any change in 18-FGG uptake on PET-CT imaging uh, following metformin treatment. And I'll just give you a bit of background as to why we're interested in 18-FGG PET-CT as a modality in this space. Um, so I'm probably just... Uh, uh, I'm preaching to um, uh, people that already understand 18-FGG PET-CT, but I'll give a brief overview anyway. So uh, as you're aware, this is uh, the 18-FGG is, is essentially a glucose analog, a radio-labeled glucose analog, and is used routinely in the clinical setting, uh, particularly to stage uh, cancer patients, although there are other applications. Uh, because tumours uh, will take, take up more glucose than uh, benign tissues, uh, typically. I mean, other certain tissues, such as brain and liver, also uh, have uh, take up a lot of glucose. Um, uh, and this is really because tumour cells need a lot of glucose-based uh, uh, carbon to proliferate, to use for fatty acid synthesis, uh, uh, amino acid synthesis, uh, nucleot nucleotide synthesis. Um, so uh, you, when one carries out PET-CT, one, one fuses a PET scan, which will image the uptake of um, uh, 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 FTG into tissues and the, to a CT scan that, that delineates the anatomy. And so you can see here, this is a lung cancer patient that you've got a uh, a, a very FDG avid tumor uh, in this patient's lung. Uh, but you can also use this technique to monitor response to therapy. So uh, you can see post chemotherapy, they've had an excellent metabolic response. But why are we interested in, in this uh, uh, technique in the context of, of possibly understanding dynamic response to metformin? Well, as I mentioned before, we, one hypothesis is that metformin inhibits complex one in the mitochondria, and if it's, this induces an energy stress, you then get AMPK activation. A key consequence of AMPK activation is that uh, you get upregulation of GLUT1 and GLUT4, uh, two uh, glucose transporters on, on cells, and so uh, you will see increased uh, glucose uptake potentially is a, you should see increased glucose uptake as a consequence of that. So if you are seeing a mitochondrial effect from metformin uh, that has any sort of, causes any sort of significant energy stress, this is one of the first sequelae that you should see. So, uh, firstly, we carried out a static 18 FTG PET CT analysis. So um, you can analyze PET data in, in different ways. Uh, this would be what you do standardly in the clinic. So you give a dose of 18-FTG, you take an image 45, 60 minutes afterwards, depending on your protocol, and you just get that snapshot of uptake of 18-FTG at that point. So in this here, we did not see any change in 18-FTG uptake in our, our primary tumors. Um, so this is a little disappointing. It was one of the first analyses we carried out. <laughs> Um, but thankfully, uh, Fergus had, Gleason had suggested we also carried out dynamic imaging, and we had a lot. We had a core set of medical engineers in the department who were able to help uh, carry out this modelling and analysis for us. So, with dynamic PET, uh, instead of just taking that one 
uh, scan 45, 60 minutes after the do giving the dose of STG. Instead, you take a series of images um, uh, over that time period, many more at the beginning, and you can therefore carry out a kinetic analysis um, to understand uh, change in, uh, 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 or the change in rate of uptake over a period of time. In this context, you then have to also uh, integrate an input function that gives you a readout of change in activity of FTG in the bloodstream over that period of time, um, because obviously that will change, as, uh, given it's a radionuclide. radionuclide. Um, so uh, we, um, in, this, in, in our study, we used the uh, left ventricle, which is well described as, as a good way of doing this. Um, <clears throat> once you carry out the analysis, you can then come up with a variable KFTG, which describes the rate of intracellular FTG phosphorylation. Uh, and this has been shown to be, in a number of other studies, to be more sensitive to changes in FTG uh, uh, uptake than just standard uh, SCV max that you use in the, in, in the clinical setting. So, this is, this is the dynamic agent, the results of the dynamic agent FTG PET CT analysis. We, we, we actually, so, we, overall, we saw actually an increase in KFTG. So, an increase in uh, the flux of uh, um, FTG into the primary tumor following metformin treatment. So this is quite exciting. Um, you can see in this patient here, we had one of the higher, greater increases in FTG uptake that the patients uh, uh, pre-metformin, we can't see any auxiliary nodes. Two weeks later, they have lit up, which may or may not be, we think is probably a consequence of the fact that metformin has increased FTG uptake into, into, the node, into those nodes. Um, so potentially, therefore, dynamic 18 FTG PET-CT could be a dynamic biomarker of metformin's effect um, or on, on, on breast cancer metabolism, although this is not a technique that you could take into the clinic anytime soon. Um, so besides the imaging assays, we also uh, carried out uh, tissue-based assays alongside, which makes us, made the study a lot more powerful. So first of all, we carried out metabolomic profiling using mass spec with a collaborator in Cambridge. Uh, uh, and looked at a series of different uh, metabolites uh, that we thought might change in the mitochondrial space. Uh, and these were uh, um, the four metabolites where there was a significant uh, 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 difference in level following metformin treatment. So gluconate, two short-chain acetyl short uh, carnitines, acetyl carnitine and propanol carnitine, and citrulline. So uh, this is a bit speculative. But I, I, I thought I'd just sort of show you uh, uh, why these changes might be might be relevant. So, uh, acetylcarnitine and, and, and uh, propanol carnitine are both uh, mitochondrial metabolites. Uh, acetylcarnitine uh, is a key way by which uh, uh, carbons can be pulled from citrate. Um, and propanol carnitine is a breakdown product of, of, of fatty acid optional. That's, that's where the mo most of uh, propanol carnitine comes from. Um, and we saw lo lower levels of these two metabolites possibly in indicating mitochondrial interference. We also saw a decrease in citrulline. A citrulline is the only uh, me uh, metabolite of the urea cycle that is synthesized within mitochondria. Uh, and so again, this suggests this possibly alludes to uh, a mitochondrial effect of metformin. And lastly, we saw an increase in gluconate, uh, and this is really speculative, uh, but uh, this possibly reflects uh, um, a shunting of glucose carbons away from uh, glycolysis, going further down the glycolysis pathway uh, because they can't be utilized by the mitochondria. Um, as I say, speculation, really. But, uh, but did our change in the metabolite levels link to our imaging assays? So, well, yes, they did. It, there was actually a strong uh, correlation between, a positive correlation between change in acetyl carnitine levels and uh, change in ATNFG flux. Moving on to the transcriptomic analysis, uh, we carried out whole transcriptome RNA seq. And when we carried out initial pathway 
uh, analysis, one of the striking things was that there was a, a large number of pathways associated with metabolism that were either upregulated or downregulated, as you can see in this circos plot on the, on the left in the left panel. Even more striking was that there were a great number of mitochondrial pathways associated with mitochondrial metabolism that were significantly upregulated following metformin treatment. And many of these were the most significantly upregulated pathways that we saw on pathway analysis. We then looked to integrate the transcriptomic data back to other, other, other assays. The first thing we do is, was carry out hierarchical clustering, uh, looking at four key pathways, uh, of hierarchical clustering of genes, looking at four key pathways that we ex might expect to be modulated in the context of, of mitochondrial interference. So oxidative phosphorylation, TCA cycle, uh, glycolysis, and spartate and glutamate metabolism. So spartate and glutamate are, uh, are, are key amino acids that uh, um, uh, uh, are important in, in providing, uh, um, or their synthesis uh, and utilization are, are key with regards to uh, certain resistance mechanisms related to mitochondrial inf interference, and it has been shown in metformin in, in preclinical studies. But anyway, what was what was the that there were uh, there was a group of eight patients who had a sort of global activation of a uh, number of genes that annotate to these pathways. Um, and we called this group the um, OXFOS uh, transcriptional response group. Uh, we then went on to see if there was, to relate that back to our other assays, and here we saw that uh, for the OXFOS transcriptional response group, if anything, actually, we didn't see any change in uh, uh, FTG flux, but rather it was the other patients where we were more likely to see an increase in FTG flux. So we termed these guys the, the FTG response group. When we looked at our, uh, some of our metabolites, and we also saw that there was a, a discrepant picture here between the two groups. So uh, the Oxford, for the OXFOS transcriptional response group, we saw a marked decrease in uh, uh, is, uh, we saw a decrease in acetylcarnitine levels from, following metformin, but this was not really observed in, uh, on a general level for the uh, acetyl for, for the FDG response group. So we just looked at sort of a, a key set of genes at this point that annotated to um, uh, path mitochondrial uh, metabolic pathways. We then went on to look at the whole transcriptome. And when we carried out hierarchical clustering of the whole transcriptome, we again saw um, that uh, uh, the um, uh, OXFOS transcriptional response group clustered together. When we looked at clustering of genes, uh, the fold change of clustering of uh, fold change of genes um, um, that are encoded by mitochondrial DNA, uh, once again the OXFOS transcriptional response group clustered together. Uh, giving, giving us greater evidence that we were seeing a, a real effect here. But how might this ref reflect back on uh, possible therapeutic uh, effects? So we used a metagene approach and uh, observed that uh, for, for the OXFOS transcriptional response group, if anything, there was an increase in expression of genes that made up uh, a well-validated proliferation metagene, suggesting, if anything, that these guys were uh, resistant to treatment, whereas there are a number of patients in the FTG response group who had a decrease in, in expression of this proliferation metagene, suggesting they, this, they may well be more sensitive to metformin. I alluded to the importance of glutamine and aspartate on the previous slide. So we know that uh, glutamine, utilization of glutamine, carbons, uh, because they can avoid the TCA cycle via a process of, uh, called reductive carboxylation and thereby be used for A, aspartate synthesis, and B, uh, fatty acid synthesis, that utilization of glutamine is a key uh, uh, resistance pathway to mitochondrial interference, hypoxia as it happens, and also uh, metformin. Um, 
And so we wanted to, to hone down on, on some of the genes involved in uh, glutamine metabolism and then also aspartate metabolism, uh, particularly with a view to possibly targeting these genes uh, uh, to see if we, to the, to the, in, the, in future clinical studies or, or targeting these pathways in, uh, in future clinical studies to, to try and get additive benefit uh, alongside metformin treatment. And we saw that, uh, firstly, there are a number of genes uh, with increased uh, expression uh, uh, that, that are key uh, checkpoints for these pathways, in particular isocitrate uh, dehydrogenase of the reductive carboxylation pathway, and then a large number of genes had increased expression that, that, that regulate the aspartate malate shuttle. Um, but also, uh, it seemed that there was a markedly increased expression, uh, particularly uh, in the OTR group versus the FTG response group. Uh, suggesting that certainly these pathways were activated, at least in some patients, and therefore there may be an opportunity to target these pathways uh, in combination with metformin. And there are already drugs out there that target uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase uh, in the, coming into the clinic. Uh, and there are others being developed to target, target aspartate metabolism. Um, we also related the uh, uh, expression of certain genes back to our imaging data. Uh, and so, for example, here we, we saw that uh, uh, expression of GLUT1, a uh, key glucose transporter, uh, uh, had a strong positive correlation with change in 18-FTG flux, which is what you might expect. So earlier I mentioned that we also that there's also a separate hypothesis that suggests that, that um, uh, considers that uh, it's possibly metformin's effects on host metabolism rather than a direct effects on the tumor cells that are most important for driving any pharmacodynamic effect of metformin uh, in the cancer context. And certainly, so we measured, uh, we, we took blood samples pre and post metformin in, 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 our, in our window study. And uh, in these non diabetic, uh, they had to be, uh, they had to have a fasting glucose to get into the study uh, that, were, that, that, that determined that they were not diabetic. Uh, uh, we saw in this group of patients that there was a decrease in, in a number of uh, uh, metabolic, host metabolic markers. Uh, following metformin treatment, including glucose, insulin, C-peptide, which is an excellent marker of insulin secretion, and then HOMA, which is a function of glucose and insulin, a good determinant of uh, insulin uh, uh, sensitivity. Uh, there weren't dramatic decreases, as you might see in, in a diabetic patients, but there, there was there were strongly significant, there were small but strongly significant, and consistent. So we then used our transcriptomic data to try and see if there was a relationship here. Uh, and we wanted to understand whether the change in expression of um, uh, uh, genes um, correlated with uh, the, different, uh, the change in our different uh, uh, assays, including the yeah, 18 FTG flux, uh, C-peptide, that's a good measure of circulating insulin levels, uh, and uh, one of the key metabolites that we measured in the tumor, acetyl carnitine. And what we observed was that there were a, a great deal, uh, a, great, a, a large number of genes that, uh, whose change in expression significantly uh, uh, correlated with change in both 18 FUG flux and also acetyl carnitine. But this was not the case when we, related, when we looked at C-peptide, and this was highly significant, suggesting that the change in these two assays are linked. Um, and from this data, we think, we think this basic data gives a good indication that we are seeing a, a direct effect of metformin on tumor metabolism, and it's not related here, or that, or, and that the key driver is not the effects on uh, uh, circulating insulin. Um, of of course, we can't determine mechanism uh, um, uh, absolutely in, in, in a study 
like this, which is where we have to make certain inferences from, from the data. But I think this was a, a very intriguing finding. So in conclusion, uh, metformin increases FTG flux into primary breast tumors. And this is consistent with the upregulation of glycolysis or at least glucose transport into cells, uh, tumor cells. Um, uh, and this would be consistent with a uh, metformin having a direct mitochondrial effect. Metformin reduces short chain ACR carnitine levels and upregulates multiple mitochondrial pathways at the transcriptomic level in primary breast cancer. And we describe two metabolic response patterns that may define sensitivity to metformin. So if you want to read it about this a bit more, it came out of cell metabolism actually about four weeks ago. Uh, and it's um, open access, so you don't have to pay anything to look at it. Um, next steps. So we, there's some intriguing data uh, published by a number of groups. This is the, the, um, the seminal paper from about four years ago that shows that um, if you knock out certain genes in complex one, the certain subunits of complex one, you can markedly change or reduce the sensitivity of tumors to, to metformin. And then there's quite a lot of data to suggest that uh, um, mutations in complex one really do significantly alter uh, sensitivity to um, various mitochondrial insults, such as hypoxia or um, uh, low glucose levels in vitro and in vivo. Um, and so we've now got some funding to carry out whole exome sequencing so that we will be able to uh, assay the mitochondrial mutational burden, but particularly focus on complex one mutations uh, uh, using bank samples from the study and then relate back to that back to the uh, uh, metabolic response patterns <laughs> that, that, that I've just shown you. And that might give us some baseline biomarkers that we can then test in future trials. We're actually working with a, a group that have uh, uh, um, uh, completed an adjuvant study in setting of breast cancer in which they gave five years of metformin to three and a half thousand patients. Well, half of them received metformin, the other half were randomized to placebo. Uh, and so uh, they have very good long-term outcome data in that setting. And, and potentially if we can show that our resp metabolic response patterns are relevant, are, are related to the mitochondrial mutational burden uh, using their banked um, translational samples that they took from a, in that, in that study, uh, we could then potentially look at that assay in, in, in a clinical context uh, or relevant clinical context. So I'd just like to thank everyone that was involved, particularly Adrian Harris, uh, who uh, was instrumental in setting up the study, uh, the Oxford Cancer Imaging Centre, uh, Dan Liu uh, and um, John Fennett, who's now moved to Liverpool, uh, carried out the, the, the PET analysis, uh, Francesca Buffer, Syed and Wee Chen, uh, carry out the bioinformatic analysis, mainly with the transcriptomic data, but also uh, help with some of the metabolomic analysis as well. And then uh, Christian and Eduardo uh, carried out the mass spec uh, of, of the tumor sample. And lastly, these are our funders. It was quite, quite a lot of funding, you can imagine, a study like this, uh, uh, and we uh, are very grateful uh, for the help they've given. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you.